Music. It's the love of music that brings us together. The love of music that forms the bond between us. For the next hour, join us for the love of music, presenting those aspects of music which excite, provoke, and inspire. Our host today is David Dubow, WNCN music director, pianist, educator, and writer on music. Here is David Dubow for the love of music. This is David Dubal, and I am pleased to have with me today the president of the Bruce Hungerford Memorial Foundation, his name, Werner Eisler. Why are we doing a program today on Bruce Hungerford? Well, January 26th, 1977, this very great artist was literally slaughtered on the road with three other people in an automobile on his way back from a lecture at the Rockefeller uh, University. Uh, Hungerford was born in 1922. I knew him not well, but enough, Werner, to understand not only that this was a great musician, but a very great man. I'm glad to have you here. Well, I knew from him that he uh, valued his acquaintance with you. And he spoke of you often, and he appreciated the fact that uh, WNCN uh, broadcast his recordings, which I think you all of us agree uh, will amount to historic highlights in the recorded art. I believe so. Uh, I know that on Vanguard he was given carte blanche to record the 32 sonatas, a, an ambition that many a pianist wants, but few have the chance to do, and unfortunately, he created 22 phenomenal performances. He didn't get to the immortal 32, unfortunately. That's right. Uh, but talking about completeness, of course, it is a tragedy that of all people, his last 10 sonatas didn't get done. But I think the treasure that we do have is of such value that, that transcends the question of completeness. Would you agree m with me, Mr. Eisler, when I say that every student thinking of essaying a Beethoven sonata should certainly acquaint themselves with Hungerford's conceptions? I think it's one of the epochal uh, ways at this repertoire, along with Schnabel's, and I would certainly agree with you. Absolutely. Now, I will ask you, what does the Memorial Foundation of Bruce Hungerford do, what are the aims, and so forth. Well, that requires me to tell you how it came into being. Do that. Uh, of course, uh, you realize that Bruce Hungerford's career uh, was moving along fairly slowly. His artistry outpaced his career by miles. Um, Bruce was beginning to make an impact because of the gathering momentum of the recordings. He was playing more and more concerts. Vanguard was uh, now talking about uh, recording him in the Beethoven Concerti, and all of a sudden, this accident cut every bit of this off. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there is something that Bruce Hungerford has to tell us through music that's permanent. Uh, too many times, uh, Accidents happen, people pass from the scene, and new things come along. Uh, our effort is to keep his artistry alive, to keep the awareness of the Hungerford sound alive. And, of course, very soon you find out that, well, the collected works of Bruce Hungerford exist, so how else do you serve this? Mm -hmm. uh, how else do you translate the influence that this man has had on his art except to encourage young people, the artists of the future? Yes. And that is what we're doing. This is why the Foundation has established a Bruce Hungerford Memorial Award of $1,000 mm -hmm. that is given each year to an especially promising young pianist whom we select. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is the fifth season? This is now the fifth season. Uh, we have uh, made, I think, a mutually um, beneficial arrangement with Young Concert Artists mm -hmm. Incorporated, with Susan Wadsworth Organization, who has done such marvelous work in promoting young artists for the last 20 years. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, made the Hungerford Award available as an additional thing that is 
uh, that their semi-finalists or finalists can uh, get. Um, and for this, we have a panel of three people who knew Bruce Hungerford and knew his, his work well. And uh, we listened to these semi-finalists and finalists, and we've so far come up with four remarkably uh, excellent young people. Can you tell me a little about them? I can, I can give it to you because these are these are part of his legacy also. That's right, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the first one in 1978 was an Italian named Sandro De Palma, uh, a real virtuoso, but a virtuoso with a brain. Mm -hmm. Did a staggering uh, funerai, wonderful Tempest Sonata. Bruce would have approved that, mm -hmm. and he has since uh, made a career in Europe. He's done did very well in the. Uh, uh, Rubinstein competition in Tel Aviv uh, mm -hmm. last year, and we keep hearing good reviews. Great. Norman Krieger, mm -hmm. who was just about to get his bachelor's from Juilliard, mm -hmm. uh, won the award in 1979. And the same year, he made a New York debut in uh, Carnegie Hall with the National Orchestral Associ Association playing the Brahms D minor concerto. And I'd like to quote something from uh, Shirley Fleming's review in the Post. Sure. Um, it says, the best news of the evening was Norman Krieger, was his debut, who approached the music in a grand-scaled way. He had the equipment to live up to his ideas. There was fire and brilliance aplenty, and the music always sang. Mm -hmm. Now, all of these things together in the Brahms D minor concerto, I about as much as you can ask. Uh, 1980, we had a very young winner, an Australian girl by the name of Catherine Selby, who mm -hmm. was then 17 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy went back that summer for a tour of uh, um, Australia, a number of orchestral and solo performances, and uh, She's called The Pianist with a Future, eminently worth hearing right here and now. That's the right. summary. Now, Hungerford's home country is uh, Australia, actually. He was born there. That's right. Now, is he known there, or is he primarily known in America? He's primarily known in America. You know that he changed his name from Leonard, the name under which he left Australia, to Bruce mm -hmm. in 1958, uh, the year after he came back from a extensive Australian tour. We did 33 concerts in, in um, uh, a couple of months' time. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't think he ever went back as mm -hmm. Bruce. So it's only his family in Australia that really knows him as Bruce. It's so characteristic that uh, you said that his um, artistry was so ahead of his career. A man in his 30s changing his name, although it was uh, a, a youthful name, he had become known as Leonard. He now, out of conviction, that characteristic conviction that Bruce Hungerford had, for he sensed certain things, and you said to me that the name Bruce meant strength to him. And, uh, and he, this is certainly an, another reason where his own um, personal reasons for doing something always went really before the career in a way. Well, he is the one person I have known in my life who refused to compromise. Mm. He had his strong ideas. You may not agree with him all the time, but they were his ideas, and they were in total the thing that formed him as a person and that formed him as an artist, that mm -hmm. made him the, the, the absolute beacon of excellence that he represented not only to me but to a great many people who knew him. Werner Eisler is my guest, and he is the president of the Bruce Hungerford Memorial Foundation, and this is a program in memory of the great Australian-born pianist Bruce Hungerford. And we're going to begin with a private disc that Mr. Eisler brought us, and it's the first movement of uh, the Bach Toccata in C major, uh, the prelude, and I know you love this performance very much. It's a fantastic performance. It's somehow a work that one doesn't hear very often. Uh, there are not many... Uh, recorded performances of it, certainly none finer than this, and someday I'd like to come back and play the whole thing. And you will. Here now is the late Bruce Hungerford in the Bach Busoni Toccata in C, the prelude movement only. <laughs> Thank you. 
You have heard the great Bruce Hungerford in The Prelude from the Toccata in C by Bach, transcribed by Buzzoni, and in it one can hear, as in all of his performances, a wonderful mind at work structurally as well as emotionally. After these words, we'll be back with my guest, Werner Eisler, who was here to discuss Bruce Hungerford, who died the 26th of January, 1977. Werner Eisler is my guest, and he's the president of the Bruce Hungerford Memorial Foundation. Uh, tell us how one joins this. I know how important it is for you to keep this artist's memory alive. Well, we have contributors from around the world who um, have made their tax-deductible contributions, and through them we have been able to finance, fund the Bruce Hungerford Memorial Award and our activities. Uh, you can contact us at 101 Station Road, Irvington on Hudson, 10533. We also have a memorial album that... Oh, that's a treasure. That's an absolute treasure. Tell me about that. It originated that. here. Mm -hmm. It originated in a broadcast that was arranged by you mm -hmm. with Bob Lurie, who was then a senior producer at Vanguard, on very short notice, immediately after Bruce's death. And three of us came and spoke about Bruce and uh, played his performances, and this has been edited down. Uh, and you, the lucky first hundred or so people can, who contact us can get what we have left in yes. the way of albums. $25 or more gets you the album and a tax-deductible receipt. Uh, Werner, we will later in the program be actually hearing from this album, which uh, contains uh, so many things, but we'll be playing the, the famous uh, Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring in the, uh, in the Myra Hess, who was such a close friend of Bruce's. Um, and we'll hear his voice giving tribute to um, his own teacher, Carl Friedberg. Now we'll get back to the foundation. We spoke last time about the winners in the previous uh, years, but uh, we, we really neglected the winner of this year's. Well, this year's winner, 1981, was Natalie Beratagrin, who is from France, uh, and who played a stunning Mozart, an absolutely marvelous Chopin F minor ballade, and uh, some magnificent Ravel. Uh, she'll be in New York, I believe, uh, late September, early October. I think she can be heard here. I'll, I'll let you know when, when I know for sure. Fine. We're going to return to music because we have four or five more selections on this program, and we'll hear Bruce Hung Hungerford from a private disc uh, that you brought us, and it will be the Opus 38, number two, Song Without Words by Mendelssohn.
That was Bruce Hungerford playing the song Without Words, Opus 38, number two in C minor. And after these words, we will return for more of this memorial program to the great Australian-born pianist Bruce Hungerford, 1922-1977. My guest today is Werner Eisler, who is the president of the Bruce M Hungerford Memorial Foundation. I know that your son studied with this great man and teacher. Tell me of him as a teacher. We were discussing the wonderful and unique sound, that full and expressive sound that Hungerford had. This is one of the biggest things that Bruce would stress to him everything began with sound because it's the indispensable means by which the musical message gets carried and if you have a harsh percussive sound all the lyrical beauty in the repertoire in which he specialized would be lost before you started that was yeah. his opinion and he would start all his students with round tone exercises he would give them the duetto by um, Mendelssohn, one of the songs without words, as an exercise in melody and tone in phrasing mm -hmm. and in, in beautiful singing sound. And everything else came after that, of course. You, you talked about structure already, textual fidelity, the particular penetration of the literature that that set Bruce apart, I think, from everybody else. There was never any fussing. It was a straightforward expressiveness, and yet so subtle always. And he had this fantastic rhythm. I mean, you could hear, let's say, Opus 10, number 1, and you could hear almost all of the later Beethoven's C minor sonatas coming, coming alive in this performance of this early one. You know, I think you have something there. I think the, the way he saw Beethoven anyway it was in one piece. Yes. So you could not separate the Mozart or Haydn-esque period from Opus 111, that one grew into the other. We're going to actually hear now from that very early but grand sonata in E-flat, the first movement, but uh, I would like to say that um, every every single Hungerford Beethoven recording on Vanguard is, is so important. I'll, I'll never forget when Hungerford was up to the station probably around 1970, and his modesty was, but nev never a false modesty. He was so so totally direct. Well, he knew his worth, I think. Yeah, he knew his worth. But w w one day he said, uh, "I, um, I'm going to someday myself be be playing the Hammer Clavier on these records, and every time I hear Schnabel play it, I wonder." I wonder if I can, you know, plumb the depth, so to speak, like that. These are not his words, but his love you know, for other people's that you great work. you talk about the Hammerklavier, because, of course, the love for, for Schnabel, the love for Courtois, I think those two great pianists from the past, I think they were his great stars. Mm -hmm. But the Hammerklavier, I don't think anybody ever heard him play a note of it. He really? worked on it for years. I was in his studio the day he died. That was on the piano. Yeah. He was constantly thinking of that Mount Everest of the That's piano right. literature. Unfortunately, we will never get to hear that recording because he was killed on the road with three other people. When his mother, who was four weeks away from being 90 years old, and I remember the first time I ever came into contact with the name Bruce Hungerford was when I myself was teaching at the New York Institute for the Education of the Blind in the he Bronx. Was there. I was there, and there was a wonderful pianist and head of the music faculty there, Elizabeth Toady. Yes, and, I know her. Oh, Elizabeth Toady was a wonderful uh, artist and still is, and she loved Hungerford's playing, and she brought him to the school uh, annually uh, for almost like a, a benefit concert for he, Bruce's mother. That's and I right. remember it was always around her mother's ber her birthday. Yes, and Bruce... Bruce one one season played the Opus seventy nine that uh, that uh, little sonatina uh, sonata which was the mother's favorite. What a tragedy this was. We're going to Werner now hear the grand sonata in E flat Opus seven by Beethoven in the hands of Bruce Hungerford.
the Beethoven Opus 7, first movement sonata in E-flat, in that gigantic rhythmical sense, that almost symphonic rhythm, I would call it, in that Bruce Hungerford had. And this program is dedicated to his art. And my guest is Werner Eisler, who is president of the Bruce Hungerford Memorial Foundation. And we will take this break and be back, and we will hear more on Hungerford, and we will hear him do the F minor Chopin etude. Werner Eisler is here, and we're talking about Bruce Hungerford, who died in 1977 on the highway. Right at the height of his powers, that's so tragic. You know, the, the man was only 54. You were talking about uh, that, that scholarship and artistry combined. Well, that's right. Uh, there is a tremendous artistic personality, and there is the scrupulous textual care that goes into this thing, but there's something that transcends us. There's a spiritual quality about his playing which was, which was never far away from Bruce's existence. And altogether, the scholarship, the artistry, the spiritual element really combined in communication at the highest level. And, you know, as a photographer, he was also a poet with a camera. I have never seen more effective photography than his, of Ambach, of various things. Now, you know he had a reputation as an Egyptologist. Yes, I know that. In fact, he was killed on the way back from Rockefeller University, where he had given one of his Egypt lectures. He also recorded 17 segments of half an hour each uh, in an... Uh, um, Audio-visual, wasn't audio it? Audio-visual. Uh, it's called The Heritage of Ancient Egypt, and it's illustrated with 1,200 of the most stunning transparencies that you'd want to see. Has this, has this been published? Yes, it has. Uh, it's in various universities throughout the country. It's published by Automated Communications, of which, by the way, Bob Lurie uh, was an officer, and Bob did much of the same production and technical work uh, on that series as he did on many of the Vanguard Well, recordings. he is an amazing technician yes, and is. a sensitive artist himself. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob Lurie, is he part of the um, Bruce Hungerford Memorial? Oh, yes, he is a director of the foundation. He did all the tremendous technical work in getting our memorial album ready for publication. And uh, he is also the man in whom Bruce reposed an enormous amount of respect and, uh, and reliance. Uh, he always told me that if Bob were to do the editing of his recordings, mm -hmm. uh, he wouldn't worry about it. And no. It so happens that this is the way it was left. The last album, of course, was produced by Bob and edited by him. Yes. We're going to hear his Chopin, although not as well known for Chopin, Tell me about your feeling of his own rubato, his sense of rubato. You know that so many people just twist and turn Chopin. Well, <laughs> it was never manipulated. The great artistry, of course, as you know well as a musician, is to make a thing seem simple yeah. uh, and spontaneous. And this is the way it was with Bruce. It was always an organic part of the work. It was never something that seemed artificially added. Yeah. And we'll hear it. Let's hear from the uh, Nouvelle Etude of Chopin. This is outside of the series of 24, three that he composed later in his mm -hmm. career. We're going to hear Opus 25, number two, the etude in F minor, Bruce Hungerford, the artist.
You have heard two Chopin etudes, both in F minor, uh, Opus 25, number two, and the number one of the Nouvelle etudes. Uh, Werner Eisler, I know you love his playing, and you you know what he was trying to do with so many years of, of listening to him. He talked an awful lot about it. Yeah, I'll bet. Tell me about your own personal knowledge of Hungerford. We haven't discussed that. When did you meet him? Well, we had a letter of introduction from a friend in Australia uh, when Bruce got a scholarship to come to Juilliard. And it was a friend of my parents from Europe uh, who told us he would be here. And, and so he came and he came to my parents' house, and uh, since I have had a love affair with the piano and its literature anyway for all my life, I was very interested, and we became very good friends. He's excellent company, told all kinds of Beecham stories. You should hear him tell stories about Sir Thomas Beecham. It's one conductor he absolutely revered. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it just went on for years. Uh, my wife... Uh, also met him that early in in, in uh, our lives. And as a matter of fact, he gave us a wedding present, uh, which he duplicated 20 years later in the, in the LP version, uh, the the Fourth Symphony of Mahler by uh, Bruno Walter. And so, 30 years after that was a tragic day, and I do think it's a thoroughly tragic day, that we had to send out the first mailing that uh, announced the formation of the Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I had always thought that Bruce Hungerford was such a strong person that he would go on forever, he would survive us all, because there was the spiritual as well as the physical strength there. Yes, it's almost painful to think yes. um, that uh, that we are so vulnerable and that uh, such a great man can be just snuffed out on the highway so well, easily. Well, the thing is that we, we want to get something out of it for the future. Bruce, I think, served his art nobly. And I think we want to, if we do anything with this foundation, it is to continue the service to the art, which in this context means the artists of the future. And this is what we're trying to... Uh, do more and more. I admire and respect what you're doing, and believe me, I well understand that Bruce Hungerford did not have a noble uh, bone that was not noble in his body. He just was, he was a man that had an aura around him, actually. He just, he had something that was special. You knew that without having to know him long. He never compromised with what he saw as the ideal standards. Mm -hmm. Some very wise man once said to me, all compromise is immoral. That's a very difficult uh, concept. We're going to hear a composer that was deeply embedded in uh, Hungerford's psyche, and that's Brahms, and we're going to hear him in the Capriccio in B minor, Op. 76, number 2.
This program is dedicated to the memory of Bruce Hungerford, and we heard that great artist playing the Capriccio in B minor of Brahms, Opus 76, number 2. And it's interesting to note that Hungerford took from every source possible. He, he studied with, with the flamboyant romantic uh, Friedman, Ignaz Friedman, and he studied with, with Myra Hess. And uh, who else? Well, the great teacher of his life was Karl Friedberg. Friedman. to whom Myra Hess referred him. And he studied with a Courtauld pupil, Roy Shepard, in Australia. Interesting that you would comment on that, because just briefly, um, one thing that strikes me about Bruce was that he did take all of mm -hmm. these, but he never really became a copy of one or the other. Oh, no. He assimilated it all in becoming a first-rate artist in his own mind, and that, I think, is what we have a challenge to do. Werner Eisler is my guest. He's the uh, president of the Bruce Hungerford Memorial Foundation. And we're going to hear from that memorial album, uh, which, as a matter of fact, uh, there are about 100 left. And it's tax deductible. If someone wants that album, they can um, send their $25, which is to become a member of the foundation. It's 101 Station Road, Irvington on Hudson, New York 10533. Werner, we're going to actually hear the voice, and I remember it well. It was touching when I heard it before, of Hungerford, and it's so characteristic of him. He is, in this little passage, doing honor to Carl Friedberg. After the speech, we'll conclude with that wonderful signature piece of Myra Hesse's In Hungerford's Hands, Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring by Bach. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not very good at making speeches, but I do want to say how very deeply privileged I feel in being able to give this recital tonight in honor of a great and very beloved man. I say in honor and not in memory because to me, Karl Friedberg does not belong just to the past. In fact, I feel quite sure that he's here with us tonight. He is the greatest man with whom I have ever had the privilege of being associated certainly the greatest musician and the very finest friend. And I know there are many of us who can say the same thing. Just several days ago, I received a letter from Dame Myra Hess in London, and she concluded it with these words. May you play always with him in your mind and in your heart. Now, I know there's not much that you can play after the Opus 111 without creating an anticlimax, but I'm going to play Yezu Joy of Man's Desiring, and I'm going to ask you all if you will stand, not so much in memory of Karl Friedberg, but to honor him. Thank you.
That was the sweetness and penetration of Bruce Hungerford in Bach's Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring. This has been a program dedicated to his memory, and Werner Eisler was here discussing the Bruce Hungerford Memorial Foundation. Werner, thank you for coming. Thank you. This is David Dubal, and thank you for listening. For the Love of Music, with today's host, David Dubal, WNCN Music Director. We hope you'll be with us when once again we meet to listen and exchange ideas, all for the love of music. For the Love of Music is produced by WNCN New York, GAF Broadcasting Company. Thank you.